performance, such as Ruben, who is on today, high-level performers across the board who come on and will share with you what has helped them accomplish their goals, both career and personal. So if you're joining us on, on one of our public pages where we're streaming publicly, welcome to Cheeky Scientist. Again, if you want to learn more about our radio show, if you want to get notified with just a simple message saying, hey, we're live, so you don't have to look for us, there is a many chat link that we're going to post on this page where you're watching us. We posted it in the group here for our, our members only section. You click that link, you click the blue button that says send to messenger, and guess what? You will get notified every time that we go live with the radio show. So I'm gonna pull that up here on the page and show it to you. We have a couple of things to go through. We're about three minutes away from the top of the hour. We're live on YouTube. We're live on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. We're getting started with another Cheeky Scientist radio show. We have on today Ruben Gonzalez, the author of the book, The Courage to Succeed, a four-time Olympian. That's four more times than me and probably you. There's a lot we can learn from him. Very excited to have you on watching us from YouTube. Thank you for joining us. And we are fully streaming everywhere, multiple places. Let's get all these cameras set up right. Can raise this one a little bit. And we're going to be going 100% full on live on topic in about two minutes. So again, very excited for today. What are we talking about? How to overcome the anxiety and challenge of achieving your goal, specifically for most of you watching, it's your job search, transitioning careers, right? You have to change who you are and how you think, and you have to have a lot of courage to do these things. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety with it. If you're like me, you got to the end of your career path in academia and realized, hey, I don't know how to make a transition out of academia. I don't know how to advance my career in business. I don't even know if I can handle being a business professional. Uh, there's a lot of imposter syndrome associated with that. Again, a lot of anxiety and certain fear. We're going to talk about overcoming those from a top performer, Ruben Gonzalez. We're going to be talking to PhDs who had to deal with all of those technical problems and emotional problems to transition into industry. We have a great show lined up. I am going to share my screen very quickly before we get started to show you that page that I was talking about. So if you click on that many chat link, it's going to be in the comment section if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube. It's going to be, it's in the chat box here for our members only who are on the show live. If you click that many chat link, you're taken to this page. All you got to do is click this button, this blue button that says send to messenger, and you will be notified every time our radio show happens. You'll just get one small notification on Wednesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we go live with our Cheeky Scientist radio show. Again, very excited for today. I'll show that a little bit later. I do want to mention also that we are in the midst of an enrollment for one of our advanced programs called Scientist MBA, Scientist MBA. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. You should be able to see my screen here. This is our Scientist MBA program. It's our advanced program. It's not for everyone, but if you have gaps in terms of your business knowledge, business acumen, like let's face it, most of us PhDs who have spent all of our lives in academia, this is the program for you. Uh, you get high level training from MBAs, from top 10 MBA programs worldwide. Uh, the program leaders, the MBA board in this program will take you through the steps of learning everything from economics to organizational behavior, mergers, acquisitions, everything you need to know to actually have a business conversation uh, to get hired into not just an entry level position well, where you could be working side by side with somebody with their bachelor's or master's only, but get you into a senior position which you deserve as a PhD. You don't want to start at entry level because studies show that it takes about five to eight years to go from entry level into a management track if you start at entry level. I think actually I have the figures on the data here. Yeah, five to eight years. We don't want that for you. It's all, it also puts you back quite a bit salary-wise. The average entry level salary for PhDs is about 65,000 for a management track. It's nine, uh, 91,000 or more. Uh, for management track in the US, it's about 100,000 lot of data here so check out this page uh, the program leader is Asia Isbel she's the director of new product planning at Takeda Pharmaceuticals um, she's also worked at, uh, as the operations as strategy and operations chief of staff at Baxter it's a high quality program again there's an entire board of MBAs who also have a PhD that will teach you everything you need to know about business acumen, teach you the language of business, how to think like a business professional, importantly, how to get into a management position, 
not just an entry level position. So we're going to get started here in just one minute. Welcome to Cheeky Scientist Radio. Okay, welcome to a Cheeky Scientist Radio show, another Cheeky Scientist Radio show. We are live. It's great to have you. Today's show is about overcoming challenges, overcoming anxiety to achieve your goals, especially your career goals, your job search goals. I'm Isaiah Hankel with Cheeky Scientist. We have a great show lined up for you. We have a very special guest, Ruben Gonzalez, a four-time Olympian. Here is his book. We will, we will be talking about his book, The Courage to Succeed. I'm going to show this everywhere that I can. Uh, it's a great book. You have to read it because it talks about all the psychological challenges, situational challenges your life is facing right now. We're trying to change careers. We're trying to become essentially a new person. Right? For a lot of you listening, you're trying to transform yourself from an academic to a business professional. This is no different than trying to transform yourself from somebody who you know, maybe had worked in low-level businesses before to become a high-performing athlete. Right? Uh, we're going to talk to, to Ruben about his strategies for overcoming the anxiety associated with uh, changing your path, setting large goals, and ultimately achieving them. So very excited to have on Ruben. Uh, we have several other guests on. We're going to go through our Show Me the Data section at the beginning here very, very shortly. Uh, we're going to bring on Asia Isabel, who is an MBA working at Takeda Pharmaceuticals, has experience at Shire and Baxter and Amgen, over 10 years experience at some of the biggest companies in industry. She'll be talking about how you can overcome your maybe imposter syndrome, your anxiety that you have to see yourself as a business professional, to communicate, speak the language of business, to be able to, to realize that as a PhD, you've learned highly technical things. You've had to learn at the highest level. You can apply your biggest transferable skill, which is the ability to learn quickly in industry to be successful. Excited to have her on too. Excited to have on Irene uh, Arena, Arena uh, Mencia Castano. She's gonna come on. She's gonna talk about how she transitioned into industry. She's gonna share her transition story. She, would, she won a competition for uh, elevator pitch as well. She's going to share her elevator pitch. Excited to have her on. And then, we have, of course, we have our members only section for associates only where we will be reviewing resumes. We will have some call-ins from PhDs. So again, a great show lined up. I want to share a few resources that we have for you. I want to share a few resources we have for you. So you should be able to see my screen here. If you can see my screen, for the associates here who are in our members only section on Zoom, can you type in yes if you can see the screen? All right, perfect, thank you very much. So what I'm showing here, a couple of things. Number one, I'm putting in a many chat link, no matter where you're watching this, whether you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching this on Facebook, we're gonna put in a many chat link. You click that many chat link and you click that blue button at the bottom. Just by doing that, you'll get notified every Wednesday, just a short message saying, hey, we're live. Because we go live every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with another Cheeky Scientist radio show. The only show for PhDs who want to succeed at the highest level in business. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. We are actively in the enrollment only until Friday. There's only about two more days left for our Advanced Scientist MBA program. You can learn more about this by clicking on the SMBA link that will be um, in the chat box, in the comment boxes, wherever you I also want to do a shout out to Nature. Nature did an article that featured Cheeky Scientist and more importantly featured one of our associates, Robbie Habel. The title of the article that you're seeing here is called Feeling Overwhelmed by Academia, You're Not Alone. So if you're feeling the anxiety, the pressure to transition out of academia, maybe you're not getting the support that you needed, maybe you realized, hey, I didn't get any training on how to get into a job besides a professorship. There's no professorships. I'm in a postdoc done multiple postdocs, so making very little money, maybe your lab ran out of funding, whatever it is, a lot of stress can happen during this time. You are not alone. Check out this article. It's a great article. Nature did a great job on it. We appreciate the feature of Cheeky Scientist. If you haven't gone to the CheekyScientist.com website, you're missing out because we have an incredible uh, blog section on Cheeky Scientist. Lots of articles, in-depth articles on current industry trends, in-depth articles on transition stories on resumes, CVs, different industry positions, business acumen. We spotlight other PhDs who are currently working in industry. You have to check out the blog. Just go to cheekyscientist.com slash blog. Um, 
networking, interviewing, academic issues, success stories. We have a special interest section for uh, women in science. Um, a lot of different topics are covered here. This article is fantastic. Five things I wish I knew about stock options before I signed my employment contract. You're probably thinking stock options, why do I care about this? Because you should get stock options or equity or you should be at least negotiating for it, asking for it when you apply to your job, when you get that job offer. This is something you have to start thinking about. It's one of those shifts in perspective you have to make as a PhD. Stop thinking like an academic, stop having that limited academic mindset, start having that successful and confident industry mindset. You're probably thinking, well, there's a lot of information online. I don't have time to go to Cheeky Scientist. Well, you should go to Cheeky Scientist first because we curate, we take all of the best articles online that have to do with getting a job, getting hired, different sections, and we curate them, collect them, put them together into the best industry transition articles of the week. This is the most recent one here. We, have a, we choose a, a top overall article, and we have a, a team do this, and they do it objectively, right? What article added the most value, top overall? We have networking articles, the top networking, top CV and resume articles, top interview articles, top transferable skills articles, top academic blues articles, top industry position articles, and finally, top business acumen articles. If you are not checking out these curated articles that come out every week, you are definitely missing out. And I'm gonna show one more page here before we jump into the show me the data section. If you're not able to stay for the entire radio show, you're catching us streaming, you have to go work in the lab or TA or whatever it is, you can always come back to the blog page every Friday. We take the highlights by video, we post them on our blog for you to watch. We also post the SoundCloud audio so you can listen to it while you're driving to work or while you're at the gym or while you're working in the lab, whatever it is. You can also go to iTunes and you can subscribe to us there on iTunes and you can get the audio and listen to it right from your iPhone or even your Android. We have uh, special features on the article about our guests, key takeaways, more about the show. We have timestamps so you can find things very easily. We have links, references everything you could possibly want to know about that week's show and that's special thanks to Jeanette McConnell on our team and Cheney Mays on our team and our entire team who I'm gonna bring on right now to say hello very very quickly so I'm gonna ask Mary to come on and I'm gonna ask Lisa to come on and I'm gonna ask Jeanette to come on and we're gonna to go to show me the data section after I say hello hi Mary how are you today Please say hi to Mary in the chat box or wherever you are watching from. Uh, I want to say hi to Lisa too. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hey, I'm I'm doing good. Good to see you. So, Lisa, if you get those lightning fast responses in the chat box, that is Lisa. It's very quick. Um, if you have questions, she's there to help you. And she will make sure you get all the links you need as we go through the show. So, thank you, Lisa. Please thank Lisa in the chat box. I want to say hi to Cheney. Cheney is holding up the camera right now, but we'll say hi to Cheney real quick. She has helped us with all of the media that's happening right now. If you're watching the highlights or you're watching me live streaming somewhere, it's because of Cheney. So please thank Cheney as well. And last but not least, Jeanette. How are you, Jeanette? I'm so excited to be here. Good to see you. I'm so excited. Uh, I'm gonna turn up the volume a little bit to make sure we can hear you. So Jeanette has on, you have a very professional bow tie on today. You had to, you had to make, because the shirts Writer, so you have to go with the opposite of the bow tie, right? I'm starting to learn. Uh, anyway, Jeanette's coming on for the show me the data section. We always talk about the data first. It lays the groundwork. And let's face it, we're PhDs, so there's not data to back up why this is important. We just don't care. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the show me the data section. I have Jeanette to help me because she's a lot better at uh, digging into the data than I am. She's going to keep me on track. Can you all do me a favor really quick and type in yes in the chat box if you can see the data. All right, thank you, looks like we're good here. So what are we looking at here? The, the title of this first figure is Depression and Other Common Mental Disorders, Global Health Estimates. Sounds kind of deep, right? You're probably thinking, I don't have a mental disorder. That's okay. What we're trying to show here is that anxiety is normal worldwide, no matter what country or culture you're from, People deal with this. If you're dealing with it, it's okay. Very often, when it comes to anxiety and depression, etc., the more you try to ignore it, the worse it can be. So, Jeanette, 
what else can we take away from, from this figure that's it's looking at everything from Western Pacific to uh, Southeast Asia to, to Africa to Europe, et cetera? What's the key takeaway here? Yeah, I think you nailed it. It's that like a lot of people are experiencing anxiety. It's not just you if you are anxious about things. That's everybody experiences that. And I'll add that this uh, figure is just people who've been diagnosed with these anxiety disorders. So it's actually even higher, right? Because a lot of people go without a diagnosis. And so those numbers are actually even higher, people experiencing anxiety in their day-to-day life. Yeah, and why is this important? Because anxiety affects your performance. Why do we care about anxiety? So there's like this level of anxiety that can heighten performance, like when you get like the jitters and you're ready and you get you, you sharpen your mental focus. We don't have a problem with that as PhDs. As PhDs though, we take it to like the next level. Our anxiety is through the roof and it starts to perfect our performance. We can handle a lot of anxiety compared to the average person, but no matter who you are, how strong you think you are, you can go past the level of helping your performance. It can actually hurt it quite a bit. You make worse decisions, right? Uh, you're, you lash out at people. Uh, your own biology, you get like a, you know, a facial tick. Like sometimes when I'm super stressed, my will just like have a mind of its own a little bit shouldn't probably be telling you this but it'll just like for just just a little bit right so these things affect you and and I think that's you know that's the why behind this I don't know uh, Jeanette have you ever experienced an anxious moment when you're getting your PhD yeah it's like the whole entire thing I think I was anxious the whole time I don't think there was ever a moment that I wasn't but I think it's about we'll get we'll get to it a bit later but it's about learning to channel and deal with and recognize that anxiety as just a thing Right? It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing you're experiencing and then to go from there. Yeah, I think depersonalizing it like that can, can be powerful. Um, you don't want to uh, ignore it, but depersonalizing it can help. And, and we'll talk to, to Ruben about, you know, some ways to kind of overcome, you know, the anxiety, the, the fear of what's going to happen, right? What am I going to do with my career? Did I waste all this time getting my PhD? Uh, let me just be honest for a second. This is something that I used to be like, oh, anxiety, like get over yourself. Like everybody has anxiety. Boo-hoo. I'm just being blunt. Like it was just, and I think different personality types maybe are less sensitive, but life has a way of teaching you lessons. And I was just like, this is, I used to hear about people getting having panic attacks or experiencing depression. I'm like, well, they're just not mentally enough. Like they're just too much. And you know, that might sound very, very harsh, but this is something, you know, 10 years ago, you don't have the life experiences that humble you to say, hey, this is a real thing. And nobody thinks it's real or cares until they've gone through it. My last year of graduate school, I started having legit panic attacks. And it's so funny to say that because I used to think panic attack, like this is, this is clearly fake. But it was just like an instant happened. I had too much stress going on, difficult relationship with my PI. I didn't know what I was gonna do in my career. You know, as highly driven people like PhDs like we are, we're, we're very motivated. And when we realize that, I don't know, our entire purpose or career path has been a mistake and we, we go from thinking we're right on track and we're even ahead of the curve to you're way behind, it's tough to deal with. It's like an identity crisis. And so I started having, like, it was like, this moment it happened again, just like I snapped my fingers, suddenly heart rate is through the roof, I feel like I can't breathe. I legit went to the emergency room and I'm like, I'm having a heart attack. And I think the nurse was like, no, you're fine. Uh, you're just stressed out and you're having a panic attack. And uh, it, was a, it was a moment of clarity because once you lose control, you have to lose control. Like you have to go from moderate pain to actual severe pain before you're willing to change. At least I did. And I think once you realize that this stuff matters and you start to dig into what your triggers are or what the, the red flags are that you're a little bit more stressed out than usual, that it's real power because then you can do something about it. Then you can plan ahead, you can prepare, and you can center yourself uh, before things get too, too intense. Next figure, the title is Workplace Survey American Psychological Association Harris Interactive. And so it's looking at work stress here. So the focus obviously is for all of you to get into a career that matters. A lot of you, you're really in a career. You might be in an academic career, but you're in a career one way or another. Um, the way this figure breaks down is that there's a percentage that strongly agree and there's a percentage that just agree. And then there's two different dates, two different times, right? So 2012, 2011, uh, the first set of bar graphs, their title is typically feel tense or stressed out during the workday. 2012 is 41%, 2011 is 36%, so it went up. The second set of bar graphs is have resources to manage work stress. Uh, 2012, 58% said yes, 
to have led to the global sinking. So what, what are the key takeaways here relevant to uh, work stress? You might be on mute. You guys here fine? Okay, so it's just me. Let me try to change the uh, what we're hearing. How about that? Try that. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so this is, I think, similar to that anxiety one we showed about where, first of all, just realizing that this is really common, right? Most people are feeling stress and they're, a lot of people don't have the ability to manage that stress, which leads to this anxious state, right? If you're this anxiety place where you're not exactly sure what to do um, and that's that's sort of what I took away from this you know and also that this doesn't stop with your PhD mm -hmm. right so you're not gonna finish your PhD and get a job and magically never have workplace stress again yes. so I think dealing with this and real figuring out how you can handle the anxiety and the stress now will serve you forever yeah and you know while stress might be increasing, there's also more resources to manage stress, no matter what work environment you're in. Like you said, you're gonna experience stress. Management is key though. Stress is never gonna go away. You don't even want stress to go away. You need stress to perform at a higher level. And this is something we'll talk to Ruben about. The key for every individual is finding out what that level is for you and how you manage it individually. There's things you can learn, right? Like quantitatively, you look at something with a large sample size, etc. But also, you're, you know, in one sense, you're an N of one. It's just you. You have to figure out what works for you, and I think that's that's really important. Okay, Jeanette, are you ready for this figure? This is a I am, monster I am, figure. Because so Jeanette and I were <laughs> talking. Like, Can I get settled in my chair. I'm ready. <laughs> Jeanette and I were talking before the show, and we're like, okay, this is a this is a t intense figure. But we wanted to dig through it because high, high level, very deep studies have been done, of course, on anxiety. I mean, the cost. You know, in terms of performance, in terms of just uh, you know, the healthcare costs are, are really high for a lot of these things, and they affect people on a severe level, but also on a practical day-to-day -day level. That's why we wanted to dig into it. And the question we're asking here is, okay, there's resources, but what are the internal resources that I have or that I can improve upon to help me when it comes to stress? And before that, what are the different types of stress? The article title here is Understanding the Dark and Bright Sides of Anxiety, A Theory of Workplace Anxiety. It's by Faking me out. Okay, so the, the study is by Bonnie Hayden Chang and Julie McCarthy. Um, we'll post the link. It's to uh, NCBI, NCBI report article on PubMed. Um, so it says here in the subtitle, the goal of the TWA is to model the complex nature of work, workplace anxiety, uh, thus identifying the under. I love when they say thus. Thus identifying the underlying processes and boundary conditions that determine how and when both dispositional and situational workplace anxiety can exert negative and positive effects on job performance. So. Those are really the four factors we're looking at. Dispositional, which is more internal, right? And then situational, which is more external anxiety. So anxiety from your own emotions, for example, versus anxiety from like just the stress of on the job, things like maybe there's drama in the workplace, it's not really associated with you, but you're exposed to it. Um, and then what are the negative and positive effects? How do people respond positively to this? Uh, what's, the, what's the negative route? Um, so maybe Jeanette, you can help me here. What is the difference between dispositional and situational? And then why is it important to understand that the same person can go through both of these types of stressors? Yeah, great. So dispositional is, like it said, trait-based. So it's different for everyone. It's sort of like your, what is your baseline anxiety level, ah. right? So are you, we've all met people who go through our lives and they're just like so chill, right? And then there's people who are more like me, who are a bit like, they're like a lot going on all the time, right? Yeah. And so you just have to recognize within yourself, what is your own personal anxiety level? And then how is that gonna affect your, your work? Yeah. That would be like the dispositional um, anxiety. And then the situational one is different situations, different circumstances you find yourself in. So let's say the examples they give in this paper are, like a job interview or a review or a business meeting, you know, or a sales presentation. So all these different kinds of situations 
will stress different people out differently. Yeah, and and again, let's be real. For most of you watching this as a PhD, you're a little bit type A, however you want to classify it. Yeah, there's outliers. Maybe you're more relaxed in some areas, but you can't be. You can't say, you know, what? I want to be completely different. I don't. I want to see myself as type B. I want to see myself as relaxed, not caring. It's not going to work. A big part of this is just accepting. Like this is, I'm. I'm strong at this level, high, very high, potentially high, whatever it is. You also have you have to accept that so you can find what your threshold is where your performance isn't affected. Like I, you know, one of the biggest moments of relief that I've ever had is like when I finally said, "This is just the way that I am." Like I'm never going to be like the person, you know. And I like Jeanette's little posture change. She's like, "I'm never going to be the chill person like this, right? I'm never going to be the the totally relaxed person. I'm always going to be driven. I'm always going to have goals, etc." That's how all of you are. You're going to be driven. Okay, that's just accept it. That's why you went to get a PhD. You want to have an impact. It's not bad to be driven. Um, you're going to be a little bit. You're going to be a little bit. Uh, you're going to rev at a different uh, tempo than most people. That's okay. Accept that. But figure out what the tempo is for your optimal performance. That's the key. And realize that that's that's the dispositional internal part. But also realize that what happens around you situationally can affect that. So. If we go through this figure, right, and we have these red circles here on ability, motivation, EI, why do those matter and how do they help for both dispositional stress and for situational stress? Yeah, so let's start with the dispositional um, anxiety one. And so when you're experiencing this high level of anxiety, it can lead to emotional exhaustion. So you can see that top box is emotional exhaustion. So if you are not regulating that experience, if you're just completely overwhelmed with your anxiety and you don't know what to do with it, yes. it's exhausting and you won't be able to perform at your highest level, yes. right? But the other side of this, the flip side is that if you do have the ability to regulate that yourself, to self-regulate and recognize those emotions and then do something about it, yes. that's not just suffer, um, you can actually improve your job performance, right? And in order to get there, you need those things that are circled in red. You need specific, you need to uh, trust your ability to have the motivation and to have high level of emotional intelligence. Absolutely. And we're going to bring Ruben on here in a couple of minutes. I just want to say, you know, look at those three things. These are the three things you can come back to as a PhD all the time. Ability. You know you have ability. You're capable. You're able to learn things. Look back to your past when you didn't know something and then you through work, learned it, that's ability, that can center you, just do the work, that's a big part of it, right? Motivation, go back to your reason why, why did you start doing this in the first place, why did you start your job search, why did you go down this path in your career, that's important, connect with your motivation, we tend to forget that, we just, a lot of us just execute, 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 you have to go back to your why, okay, and then finally emotional intelligence, there's a lot, if, you, if you're, for those of you that are behavioral psychologists, some people think EI doesn't even exist. It's just intelligence, like your IQ, whatever. This is good news either way. You're all incredibly intelligent. So just use your mind to be self-aware, to ask yourself different questions. We know the power of questions as, uh, you know, because a lot of you are, in, you know, most of you are in STEM, you're scientists, et cetera. Ask the right questions, gain some self-awareness, say, what am I not seeing? And this will help you. So those will all help you, and they'll help you overcome the stress, whether it's dispositional or situational. Before we bring Ruben on, I'm going to bring on Mary to ask the final question here and take us through this final figure with Jeanette. Hi, Mary. Hello. All right. Hello, Jeanette. Hey, Mary. I know you're excited about this figure, so why don't you tell us tell us about it and you and Jeanette can talk it through. Um, I, I'm interested in this figure because I, I know, we, you know we all have anxiety in different forms, but it's really nice to see that there's data showing how your workplace can influence your ability to manage that. And I think that's what this figure is about. So. Can you present yeah, yeah, the, so the, yeah. the figure on the left side of the screen, the first one, that is looking at the level of emotional exhaustion that employees experienced in a low anxiety situation or a high anxiety situation, depending on how high of quality the interactions with their coworkers were. Mm. So if you were in a place where you had coworkers that you didn't really interact with and you didn't click with, and you have um, a high workplace anxiety, that actually means that you're gonna be at a higher level of emotional exhaustion. But if you have great coworkers, you chat, they're supportive, you've got this great community going on, it actually, you can be in that same exact level of anxiety, but it's less exhausting. 
because you found this great community, this great culture to share, sort of share that burden with, right? Perfect. So, and, and I'm just going to say the title here because I, I know that we're going to, Ms. Cheney's giving me the, the cue of like, hey, this is going to be audio only. Um, so are anxious workers less productive workers? It depends on the quality of social exchange. So like both Mary and just, Jeanette just talked about, your community, your culture really matters. And you can be under more stress and handle it better if you have social connections. And, and that's what that first figure shows. So Mary, I'll let you start with figure two. Okay, I think the figure two on the right uh, addresses the um, leadership and the role that plays in the anxiety. Jeanette. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it does. So, I mean, we think about our coworkers having an impact, like it makes it fun to work there. But everybody knows that it comes down to your boss is dictates a lot of times how your vibe is, right? So we, a lot of us as PhDs know what it's like to have a negative relationship with a PI, with a supervisor. Um, and so this figure is sort of the data behind that. And so if you are in, this one looks at job performance, which is on the Y axis and then emotional exhaustion, which is on the x-axis. And that de depends on the level of, um, looked at the interaction between the employee and the supervisor, right? So when there was a high emotional exhaustion, so you have a very stressful job and you have a lot of anxiety in that job, if you don't have a good uh, relationship with your supervisor, your job performance drops dramatically. That's that lower line. Um, that's the job performance is right between two and a half and two. Um, but if you have a good relationship with your supervisor, that job performance jumps way up to about four, no matter what the emotional exhaustion level is. So even if your job is easy or hard, your performance is high if you have a good supervisor. So for me, the big takeaway for this, this figure, this paper, is that you have the ability to go out and find a place to work, right? You're not forced into work anywhere. So go do informational interviews and figure out what the culture is like at different places. Yeah. And is it gonna vibe with you? Meet with the coworkers when you go in for your interview, it's totally up to you to decide if that's a place that's gonna be supportive for you. And, and let me just be real here. I think, I think what's important here is I'm not really impressed with the left figure. Like I, I know that culture and the social interactions are important and they can help a little bit, but if the supervisor is awful, it does not matter. Like the, if you have a good supervisor relationship, your anxiety, emotional exhaustion level is so much lower, right? And your performance is so much higher. So I think that is really important for you to know. So yeah, you wanna make sure you fit in with the culture, et cetera, but a big part of that culture is leadership. So make sure the person that, you know, ask, who are you gonna be reporting to, right? Who are you gonna be working with directly? Who's gonna be giving you, you know, telling you what to do in a sense, right? And how are they gonna do it? Are they gonna approach you like a colleague or like a lot of us have experienced, are they gonna be like the fire breathing PI who just can expect you to do anything and work for 18 hours and just add to your stress. Very rare. And, and I can add too that you can learn about this in your informational interviews before you even meet this person you're reporting to by just asking about the team dynamics and how the interactions are. Um, so that's something you can, you can definitely look into. Perfect, thank you both. Thank you, Jeanette. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Please Bye. thank Jeanette and Mary for their time on the Show Me the Data section. We're gonna jump right into our first guest, Ruben Gonzalez. I'm gonna do a quick introduction here. And uh, again, really excited to have Ruben on. He is a four-time Olympian, has an incredible story to share. Uh, you'll, if you can see the screen, I'm just gonna go through a little intro here. Ruben, I'm gonna show his LinkedIn profile too so you can connect with him there. He is a four-time Olympian, award-winning keynote speaker and best-selling author of The Courage to Succeed. I have a copy of his book here, incredible book. Go check it out, go check it out. The Courage to Succeed, um, it's, it's a, it's a fast read, but the amount of information you get is a lot. And I was just impressed on the back of it, the people that have recommended this book. Stephen Covey, he wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, Ken Blanchard wrote The One Minute Manager. These are, these are high quality, like these are books that have sold incredible amounts from business speakers who have been in the industry for decades. Um, Zig Ziglar uh, wrote uh, Read It Carefully and Take It Seriously. Jim Rohn, The Absolute Truth About What It Takes to Succeed. Brian Tracy, right? All these names you've heard, just really, really impressive. Um, probably the best lineup I've ever, possibly ever seen in terms of uh, high-level business professionals endorsing a book. Um, he is the first person ever to compete in four Winter Olympics in four different decades. Incredible. Spoken to over 100 of the Fortune 500 companies since 2002. Appeared on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, CNN, New York Times, 
Success Magazine, Time, Business Week, and Forbes. Featured in three chapters of Jack Canfield's book, The Success Principle. Jack Canfield wrote the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. So definitely check out the success principles there too. Um, his story takes people's excuses away. He was a bench warmer in school sports. And then when he's 21, which is really late to get involved in training for any sport, uh, in just about any sport in the Olympics, uh, that's when he started training. Uh, four years and a few broken bones later, he made it uh, as an Olympian. He went on to compete at the Winter Olympic Olympics in four different decades. Um, so really excited to talk to him, uh, to talk to Ruben, who's gonna join us real quick after I show his LinkedIn profile. So with all of you, we talk about LinkedIn profiles a lot. Look how amazing his uh, headline banner is. We always tell all of you that, hey, you can put text in here. You can put whatever you want in your banner. Look what he's done here. This is this is one of the best uh, banners I've ever seen and uh, really, really great job. It's on point with his professional brand. You can connect with him on LinkedIn. You can go to thelugeman.com. That is clearly the, uh, the, the sport he is an Olympian in, the luge. And so without further ado, I'm gonna bring on Ruben. How are you? Ruben, let me make sure you're good, how are you. I see you. <clears throat> good, really good to see you. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I appreciate your time. Oh, it's good to be here. Exciting. You got a, <clears throat> excuse me, you got a great team. Oh my gosh. They they you need to give them a raise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that later. No, I'm just uh, kidding. Yeah, <laughs> Shaney's like me. You're here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, the team was incredible and I really appreciate you working so well with them. Your book's amazing. You're you're a highly motivational person. And, I just wanted to say for all of you watching, why are we bringing Ruben on is because performing at the highest level, no matter whether it's as a PhD or in the Olympics, it requires you to overcome a lot of internal battles and a lot of external struggles. And so Ruben, I kind of wanted to start you know, there with you because you had to have experienced a lot of uncertainty, a lot of what we call imposter syndrome when you first decided that, hey, I'm 21, which is really late to get involved right, in, in the luge and the Olympics. What was going through your mind during that time? Why did you decide to, to become an uh, Olympian? Why did you decide to take that path? And then what were some of the initial, I guess, uh, challenges you faced kind of technically, like, oh, I have to learn how to do this sport. And then emotionally, as in like, I could fail or, and uh, there's gonna be a lot of anxiety and I'm gonna have to work hard, etc. All right, great. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I saw the Olympics for the first time on TV. And I was hooked. And what drew me to the Olympians, it wasn't the athletic side, it was their character. I thought, wow, this is a group of people that have a dream, they're willing to fight and train for years and years and years with no guarantees of success, and then they make it. I thought, man, you gotta be so strong inside to, to do that. I put them up on a pedestal, and I just wanna be like them. It was never about the medals for me, it was about, I wanna be one of those guys, right? Well, I was not a great athlete. I'm a slowpoke, okay? <laughs> So I, I was always the last kid picked for PE all my life. So I didn't believe it was possible. So I didn't take any action for 10 years, 11 years. Then when I was 21 years old, I'm watching the 1984 Sarajevo Winter Olympic Games. I see Scott Hamilton, the figure skater, he was 18 years old then. He weighed like 110 pounds soaking wet. And he wins the gold medal and he gave me hope, right? I thought, man, if that little guy can do it, I can too. I'm gonna be in the next Olympics no matter what. It's a done deal. I just gotta find a sport. All of a sudden, I had belief. Before I had desire, no belief, no action. Now I got belief, I'm ready to take action, right? And so <clears throat> I went to the library, and my nickname in high school was Bulldog. So I was very perseverant, I'm very tenacious, right? Yeah. And uh, I get this big book about the Olympics. I have to find a sport. There's all these East Germans are already good at my sport now. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> so I'm looking through the list of the summer sports. It took me five minutes to realize you gotta be a super athlete. There's no way. And I got a little down. And then as I was looking through the list of the winter sports, the analytical side of my brain kicked in. I thought, I'm about to put together a plan for the next four years. It probably would make sense to base the plan on my strengths. My strengths, perseverance, I'm pulled off. So I thought I've got to find a sport with a lot of broken bones, right? A, a, a sport that's so <laughs> tough, looks so hard, there'd be a lot of quitters, right? Yeah. And only I won't quit. I'm gonna ride that attrition rate all the way to the top. I'm not quitting. So I had it down to ski jump, bobsled, and luge. I lived in Houston, Texas, okay? I'd never seen snow before. I mean, hot, humid Houston. That's <laughs> happened to the Winter Olympics. So, so what, right? Ski jump, forget it, you know, that would have been suicide. <laughs> uh, bobsled, where are you gonna find three other nuts in Houston wanted the bobsled? You gotta go to Jamaica for that, right? <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. 
I know those guys, all right? But we're always rubbing each other. That left the luge. I'd never seen the luge on TV at that point in my life. If I'd have seen it, I don't think I'd have done it. <laughs> but I had a little picture of a guy on a luge. I thought, that's the one for me. I didn't even know where the track was, okay? So PhDs, I, I, I was pretty, you know, I didn't know much. I just knew that I wanted, I knew the destination. I knew where my ticket, uh, where I wanted to end up with my ticket, all right? And so if you want something badly enough and you're willing to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes, it's just a matter of time, all right? That's just something I believe in, and it's served me well. I didn't even know where the track was. <laughs> I wrote Sports Illustrated a letter. I figured they ought to know. It's their job to know. <laughs> and they actually wrote back. They said, Lake Class in New York. That's where the track is. I call them up on the phone. I said, I'm an athlete here in Houston. I want to learn how to luge. Yeah. So I'm being Olympics in four years, right? Um, will you help me? See, you have to be willing to ask for help, right? Yeah. Find somebody that's already done what you want to do, and they can be your mentor. They can be your coach. And so, at first, the guy laughed, right? He said, how old are you? I said, 21. He said, no way, man. I mean, we start them off when they're 10 years old. By now, you have 10 years experience. No way. I wouldn't take no for an answer. I mean, I just thought hanging up's not an option. I, I, I just started talking to the guy, making friends. <laughs> yeah. so think of something. I happened to tell him I was born in Argentina. He did a 180. He says, if you'll go for Argentina, we'll train you. And I said, why? A minute ago, you weren't going to train me at all. He said, well, the sport of luge is in danger of getting kicked out of the Olympics because we're not global enough. It's the U.S., Canada, and a handful of, of oh, European wow. countries. We're recruiting. So if you'll go for Argentina, we'll train you. You'll travel with us. We'll even lend you a sled the first year. Uh, the, we're going to have to compress 10 years of learning into two years. You're going to get hurt a lot, okay? Wow. Uh, but because the last two years, you have to get on the World Cup circuit competing against the best in the world. You're earning World Cup points to try to be on the, right before the Olympics, you have to be top 50 in the world or else it doesn't matter where you are, you're not going. So will you go for Argentina? And I thought about it for about a nanosecond. I thought, man, I'll go for Pakistan, I don't care. I mean, I don't even care with sport. I just wanna to go to the Olympics. See, the luge was the vehicle. The Olympics was the dream. You focus on the dream because that's what's gonna give you the energy to bust through those obstacles. And you just find a vehicle that, that Take you there. So I love I love soccer. Uh, I love other sports, but I'm lousy at them, right? So yeah. That was the be a good vehicle for me. This is amazing. Let me. I'm just trying to write notes because we're going through so many things that are crucial. So if you're listening closely, let me just rewind a second and break down what you said here because this is fascinating. So many key points covered. The first is reference points. So he said that his desire turned into a belief because his reference points changed. He saw Scott Hamilton. He saw somebody else who did it before like him. This is huge, right? So for all of you, if you're like, I don't know if I can be a business professional or whatever you're trying to do, find somebody else like you who's done it before. That's crucial, okay? Um, also, not taking no for an answer. We talk a lot about follow-up. A lot of us feel a little bit uncomfortable. Notice how Ruben could not care less about how uncomfortable the other person was. He'll just keep following up. That's crucial. You're polite, professional, etc. but you don't want to be concerned about, you know, you hear a no, you think that's the end of it. Don't take no for an answer. That's a huge thing. Lateness doesn't matter. A lot of you are PhDs. You're, you know, you're maybe five, ten years past where your friends were when they got their first industry job. It's not too late. You know, Ruben was, you know, uh, ten years past when a lot of people started training for it. Didn't matter. The last thing, the vehicle. So, so you know, time, uh, the the right opportunity matters. And so you want to take your strengths and line those up. Like he said, he loves soccer, all these different things. He would have done anything, but he had this opportunity. And this is why, you know, if you're searching, maybe you want to work in XYZ position at XYZ company, if you don't find the perfect fit, but there's this other great opportunity where you can still live out what you want to live out as a business professional, et cetera, latch onto that vehicle and ride it. Don't miss it because it's not the exact thing. See that opportunity. So I just want to jump in, Ruben. That was great. A lot of, a lot of great yeah. insights there. So I want to talk more about the, the, the factors. So you, you, told, you, you talked about your, your path. During what you talked about so far, were, were there any fears, any anxiety, things you had to go through during that? Because you make it sound like I just did this, that, 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 and I, I got that part. I, the luge is brutal, okay? Uh, if you start as a 10 year old, you're gonna be a junior until you're 19 years old. And so you're going from a lower start. And so they have 10 years to slowly uh, teach you the fundamentals, right? The basics, because you have to be a master in the fundamentals to be good at anything. And so you have time. And so they start you off, most loose tracks have 16, 15, 16 curves. And you're going, depending which track, 75 to 95 miles an hour. 
pulling six G's on some of the curves, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And so a little kid, when they start you off, uh, let's say in uh, Park City, Utah, the, the track in, in, in uh, Salt Lake City, they put you on curve 12 and you're going about 20 miles an hour and you crash, 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 crash. Finally, you figure it out. As soon as you do, coach moves you up a couple curves, right? Now you're going 30. Oh my God, 30 miles an hour, right? And then crash, 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 and they move you. You literally crash your way to the top. <laughs> it takes about 100 runs to make it to the top. And hopefully you don't get hurt, right? Because you have to learn. But the hardest thing is, let's say you're on curve seven and you make a mistake. Well, you don't know, right? Because because we don't have that space. We haven't developed that spatial acuity. We don't know where we are in space. And so we don't even know we've made a mistake. So you're laid out of seven, but you don't know. So you're not going to be later out of eight and then you're going to crash on nine and you don't even know why you crashed it's because you made a mistake on seven and so it takes a couple of years for your brain to learn that oh. whenever i'm trying something new i always tell myself i gotta i, I gotta train my brain i gotta train my brain right it's the, that just because once i train man, when i was when I, I learned how to uh snowboard when i was 50 and i knew it's gonna take about seven to ten days of crashing and burning and then finally the brain's gonna figure it out it's like riding a bike and so I just keep telling them that that just keeps me going. I just know that all I'm doing is training my brain. I'm learning how to pair pair motor, right? Where you have a pair sail and the motor on your back, yeah. right? Well, learning how to control the first thing they teach you is how to control that sail, and it's totally counterintuitive. It's really, but the whole time I'm telling myself, I'm just gonna try, I'm gonna stick it out because my brain's learning. I'm just gonna figure it out one day. Ow, it's done, yeah. right? So yeah. you got to be willing to do that. The first two years. They just pushed me super fast, and I'm breaking bones. I mean, I broke my foot twice, my knee, my elbow, my hand, my thumb, a couple ribs. Ooh. My neck's a chiropractor's dream because you're pulling six G's. I mean, your head's like a maraca on that loose thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a physical, right? Yeah. And then, the, then uh, you said this word. Oh, this, the, the, did you coin this imposter syndrome, or is that? No, no, it, no. <laughs> That's well, been around. Yeah, it's been around. It's a okay. yeah, in behavioral psychology, it's something that people right, they feel like an imposter and when they go into a new thing. Right. Okay, so now I'm at a World Cup race, right? Because I'm gonna have to race for the next two years because they're gonna tally up all those points so to see whether I make it. Now, imagine you've been driving, you just got a driver's out of you got your driver's permit, okay? You're a sixteen year old kid and you're fine and you're finally to the point where you're not hitting the curve all the time. You can actually make a a, a right hand turn without the back wheels of the car hitting and you're feeling so proud. Now they put you in Indy five hundred and you're in a room with Al Unser, Mario Andretti and a bunch of icons. You feel like you don't well I felt like I couldn't look at them in the eye. I, I had all this mental thing telling me, man, what the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here. I mean I this is ridiculous, but I knew I was just putting my head down. I just gotta, you know, I just gotta, I just focus on those points. I gotta get another World Cup point. I gotta get another one. I gotta get another one. And I just focused on that. And at the time, to make it even, even worse, the Germans, they totally dominate the sport. They've won 80% of the medals in the last 50 years, okay? Total domination. Okay, imagine, if, you know, the, uh, the, the Denver Broncos had won, you know, even the last 80%. 10 years. They change the rules, right? They yeah. say you can't play at altitude or whatever. They come up with something. So the Germans are the best, right? I'm already. I won't even talk to the guys that are at the bottom of the pack. Because to me, they're they're icons, right? I have this imposter syndrome going on. And to make it worse, I'll go say hello to one of the Germans, right? Hey Hans, how you doing? Nothing. It's like if I don't exist. It's like if I'm invisible. Nothing. No. So that made me feel like an ant, right? On top of that. And it was like a confirmation that's right, right, buddy, you are nothing. And so I compete for two years. I made the Calgary Olympics in 88, and then I come back and I'm going for Albertville in 1992, so I'm still competing. Two years after my first Olympics, it was like a memo went out, right? All of a sudden, all the Germans are nice all of a sudden. Hey, Gonzalez, Speedy Gonzalez, how are you? And I pissed, right? I said, what's up with you guys? I've been nice to you for six years, and all of a sudden I'm Speedy Gonzalez. He says, come on, Ruben, we have to give you the talk, right? The talk. They all sat with me. They said, look, we've been doing this. We do this for life. We commit. Commitment was the key, right? We commit for life. We started, some of us started when five years old. We became the best in our town, best in our region, best in our country. We made the national team, but we're so, we have so much depth in the German national team that we're lucky if we make two Olympics. And, and after that, we're going to be coaches. We're going to be coaches for life, right? Because this is what we do. And we're sick and tired of seeing these small countries come. They do one Olympics and then they disappear. You know what we call them? We call them Olympic tourists because they don't really care about the sport. Yeah. But this is two years after your first one. 
you're obviously going for Albertville. Whether you make it or not, it doesn't matter. All that matters is you're showing respect to the sport, so now we can show respect to you. Let me just jump in because just fascinating. So a couple of things to make this highly practical for everybody listening. He's talking about imposter syndrome. What he, what Ruben did during that time when he felt like an imposter, he said that he, he basically, he said he put his head down and went back in and focused on the point. Really, he just focused on the process. And so when we say trust the process, it's not like you're just blindly trusting whatever, but you're focusing on the process that you know works. So for those of you, if you've had a lot of rejections for jobs, you know, you're hitting a career dead end, Focus on the process of what it takes to change your career, to hit that goal, whatever your goal is, personal, professional. Focus on the process during those times when you feel like you don't belong because it'll turn you inward to the process that's going to take you forward instead of focusing on why you may not belong, etc. Also, commit. We've talked a lot about commitment. People, you know, the, the, the Germans in this story are just like the employers. They want to know that you are committed to being a business professional. You're not a tourist. You're not just somebody like an academic who wants to be a professor who's just like trying things out in business, et cetera. That commitment is important for anybody. You want to crack into any new field, right? Whether it's the, the luge or a career, you have to show that co commitment. And that's what shows people that you, um, you're for real. And I think a lot of us hold back because we don't want to come on too strong, but when it comes to commitment, you, you, want, to, you want to show up all the time, yeah. show them your commitment. Yeah, and you know, I'm still competing. I'm 56, I'm, I'm still sliding, I'm going for Beijing 2022, right? When I make that one, the coaches say, man, you're sliding better than ever, right? Uh, we, they got me, but I'm training differently now because I'm older, right? So they have me doing all this yoga and stuff because they said, your starts are awful, you know? Because you, <laughs> you, you, know, you can't get down and paddle, and we need one more mile an hour before curve one, and that's gonna translate the whole way down, you'll be fine. But now it's the top 35 in the world, keep making it harder. But so, but, what I am going to have to do to be promoted, right, from a four-time Olympian to a five-time Olympian is totally different. So what did I do? I asked the coaches, I asked the experts, what do I need to do to get promoted? And they laid out a game plan because they're the experts, right? I'm the soldier. I'm just good at finding a good general that I can follow. And so I tell people, uh, I'm actually, uh, uh, you probably figured out I'm in a hotel room. I'm, I'm in Dallas. I'm speaking for the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank in a couple hours. And, and some of those guys want to be promoted, right? And so I ask them, look, guys, all you need to do is ask your boss, what do I need to do to get promoted? Just give me a game plan. Just say, just ask him that if you're, if you're genuine, right? Uh, and you're willing to do what he says, right? <laughs> but that'll put you on top of the list. Because they're now they, at least they know, right? And can I meet with you once a week, once a month, at least, you know, to, I, I need to make sure that I'm on track, right? I don't want to wait six months or a year, and then you tell me, oh, no, you screwed up six months ago. You kind of went off on a tangent. No, right? At the end of every lose run, we get to the bottom, we pick up walkie-talkie, we talk to coaches. There's usually a couple of coaches up on the track wherever we're having problems, and, and they tell us, right? Yeah. And then we go up to the top and we do it again. Sometimes if we have time, we'll walk to that to that spot and we'll watch a couple of Italians or a couple of Germans coming by and they'll say, look, you started steering here, they, they started over here. So you need to change that a little bit. Okay, cool, now you got a little bit of a visual. Then when we get home, worst part of the day, we gotta watch the visions. Oh man, now you see how really loudly you are, right? But it's another level of analysis. Now you're actually seeing it, right? And, and then at night you do visualization, right? Visualize runs. And we don't just visualize the perfect run. Before taking a run, right? Before uh, taking a, a practice run or a race run, we visualize the perfect run. But at the hotel room, we visualize escape routes on every curve, contingency plan. It, what am I gonna do if I'm late into curve one? What am I gonna do if I'm early into curve one? What am I gonna do if I hit the, the, uh, the left wall? What am I gonna do if I hit the right wall? So, you know, if this happens, then I'm gonna do this, right? And so you have a plan. Anything can happen, and, and, and that gives you confidence because you know that you can handle it. Yeah, and I think you know that's an entire field of uh, psychology right now. It's called defensive pessimism. So if you're liking what you're hearing, you have to. It's not bad to think about these contingency plans because what you're doing is you're preparing so nothing throws you off your game. This is very important for interviewing, right? What are all the things that can go wrong during a site visit? You, you got to plan ahead, and I, and I love what Ruben said about asking for help. Ask for advice, say, what do I need to do to get promoted? Uh, I love that question. I, I wanna ask you at least two more questions. I wanna have Mary come on and ask you one of these. The two are, what are the two types of courage you need to develop to succeed in these goals? And then what is the one quality all successful people have? 
I'll save the last one for Mary, but the first one I want to ask you here. So the two types of courage that you talk a lot about, what are those two types? Sure. Uh, the name of the book, right? The Courage to Succeed. It's not about my courage to succeed. It's about the courage to succeed, right? And so the two types, you got to have the guts to get started. Sooner or later, you got to stop talking about it and get in there and do it, right? Yeah. And everything's tough at the beginning because you got no skills. So you have to give yourself time to learn the skills, and then you use the skills to reach the goal. And so uh, you have to have the courage to not quit, right? Courage to get started, courage to not quit. Courage to get started comes from belief. Courage to not quit comes from your desire. If you want something badly enough, ain't nothing going to make you quit, right? Yeah. And so the, the classic example, and everybody's heard it, your house is burning down. You're not going in there to, you know, to, to bring your big screen TV out, but if your baby's in there, you'll run through burning walls, right? So what changed? Well, your desire for saving your kids' lives is a lot higher than your desire for saving your big screen TV. Yeah. It'll make you do things that you otherwise wouldn't do. Wow, and again, and, that, and you, you touched it on it earlier, you get in touch with your why. Oh, why? Yeah, of course, you know, why, why, why? Those reference points matter, yeah. Write down your goal. I mean, I, before I'll turn on my, before I can check my emails in the morning, I have to write down my goal. That's just a rule. Right? Write it down though, okay? Because I know what it is. It's Beijing 2022. That's all, right? It doesn't have to be a dissertation. But by writing it down, the act of writing it down is an act of commitment that drives it into the subconscious mind better than just saying, yeah, yeah, I know I'm part of Beijing. That's awesome. All right, so we have Mary on here. Mary, I wanted you to ask the, the, the final question here with Ruben. Okay, can I, I'm gonna change the question if that's okay, because I think there's something, hi Ruben, nice to see you. Um, there's something that, that we don't know, yet know about you, and this was your process of writing your first book and getting it published. And I remember hearing a story when you were, when you were asking people to give endorsements, you were doing some reaching out and you had to reach out to a lot of people. And so this is like cold calling when PhDs are looking for industry positions, we have to get in touch with people we don't know, but that we are really eager to, to learn from. So can you, can you tell us a bit about this, um, the Jack Canfield? Sure. Oh, Jack Canfield, thanks, because I, I could have gone. So, oh, or someone else. No, 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 that's good. You, you, you reeled me in. So um, I, I don't know if I showed you a, pic, a, a video when we spoke in my office, but it's covered with books. I'm sure like every PhD was listening to this. You know, I, I, I'm a, I was chemistry, biology, double major, OK? Houston Baptist University. Um, my parents wanted me to be a doctor. and. It wasn't in my heart, right? And the grades showed. Uh, I'm saving lives by not being a doctor, okay? You don't want me operating on you. <laughs> but anyways, I have, uh, when I, right before the Salt Lake City Olympics, this little kid in my neighborhood asked me to be his show and tell project in school. And so when I came back from the Olympics, I took the sled, the, the Olympic torch, the helmet. I thought, okay, show and tell, right? I'm finally gonna win a medal in something. I mean, no prisoners, I'm only show and tell. Principal takes me to the cafeteria. There's 200 kids sitting there. He's, he said, you got 45 minutes, have at it. They turned into an assembly, they didn't tell me, okay? I don't look like an introvert, guys, but I am a, I, I'm an introvert, okay? You put me in a networking meeting, I'm the guy that's, that's leaning against the wall, okay? I, that's the real me. I turn it on for this. I turn it on when I go on stage, but I'm a shy guy, quiet guy, okay? I spoke, they asked me to, somebody heard in my church that, that, uh, that, that I'm a speaker. I said, hey, will you go talk to the kids? And when then I went and spoke to the kids, all the adults looked at me like, you're in the headlines. I said, what happened? Because I was a different guy than the real Ruben they're used to, okay? So I go to the school, it went really well. Principal, you know, he says, man, you got a gift. You do, the, you do this for a living. Uh, you're better than people we pay. And I said, what, you get paid for show and tell? And he said, no, it's a speaking profession, man. Don't you know anything? And apparently I did, but I was a popular salesman <laughs> and he was so on my face about it. I, I, I thought, you know, I was having fun out there. You know, I'm just telling my story. Maybe I can inspire some people to really go for it. I quit my job three days later. I figured if I can sell a copy or I can sell a Ruben too. And I just started calling all the schools in Houston. The, the principal, the president of the PTA, the, the counselor, follow up with faxes, emails, massive action, right? You, you know, you throw enough mud on the wall, someone's gonna stick, right? You can always clean up the mess later. And so that's what I did, I got booked. And then, uh, so Olympics are in February, March, April, May, I'm living the dream. I got my own business. Oh my gosh, this is great. Well, I forgot that June, July, and August, schools are out, I'm gonna be broke, right? <laughs> Three months behind in our house payment, $50,000 in credit card debt from the from, from the Olympics. 
uh, that close to losing the house, shot our credit. We were on food stamps by August, okay? And that's when I realized, oh my gosh, I tell everybody to find a coach or a mentor, and I'm not even taking my own advice. I need to find a speaker. I know how to tell stories, but I don't know how to build a business. I need a coach, you know? And so I need, I need the Isaiah of speakers, right, to teach me the ropes, right? <laughs> and so I found a guy, and the first t- thing he said when we met, he said, man, I don't care if you're a 10-time Olympian unless you write a book, no one's going to take you seriously because an author is considered the authority of his subject. He wrote the book on it. And I told him, I can't write a book. I mean, C's in English. And he says, you got a great story. You write it down. We give it to some some PhD, A students that know grammar, and they'll fix it, okay? they clean it up for you. And I said, wow, I didn't think about that. He goes, yeah, it's called editing, so shut up and sit down, right? <laughs> And so I did, and it became a bestseller. I mean, that book's been translated to like 10 different languages. Crazy, open up the door to all the world. But when I was finishing it up, I would go to Barnes and Nobles to see what the other books looked like. And I realized they got you gotta have some testimonials. And so I went to all my bookcases at home and I made a list of a hundred top guys, Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, you know, Les Brown, uh, Stephen Covey, the, all the classics, right? What's my dream list? people to write something nice for my book. And I started calling them up. I went to every website and I called them up. And you never get the guy. You always get the secretary. So after a while, I switched my my my, uh, my pitch, right, to the secretary, to the, to the executive director. When I called uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, the girl, she must, must have been her first week, probably her last week is what she did. <laughs> she said, well, Jack's right here, here. And she hands him the phone. And he gets on the phone, Jack Canfield, right? I mean, this guy's like mega. And so uh, <laughs> he gets on the phone and kind of serious, like he says, you got five minutes. But we talked for 90 minutes. We became friends. He says, I'm writing this book called The Success Principles. And man, I'd love to have you. And anyways, he put me in three three uh, chapters. He, um, uh, he had me, honestly, think you still may, uh, I was on his PowerPoint. I mean, I get all these gigs because somebody heard from me at, at Jack's, you know, programs, right? And so then around that time, Zig Ziglar came to Houston, right? I'd seen him before, but he came to the uh, to, to the big stadium where the Rockets used to play, right? It's where, where Joel Osteen's church is right now. And they were having a Get Motivated seminar. And so I went and I, I was looking for the promoter and I found him, right? And I gave him a, a CD because my coach, thank God I listened to my coach. He said, hey, record everything you do. You never know when you're going to be good and when you actually have a good audience and knows when to laugh. And so I had it, right? <laughs> and so I gave it to the guy. I said, look, bring me in to speak. I got a great story. I'll give your people hope and whatever, right? Well, the next week I had a gig in Tampa, right? And that's where these guys are based. I took the Olympic torch. I went over there and I cold called. They didn't know I was coming, okay? I didn't want to warn them. And so I went in there and said, hey, is Peter here? Peter alone? And they said, no, he's not here. But he was, but they lied, right? And so I talked to this girl, right? And, and, and her name was Hannah. And I had actually met her up at that big stadium. He says, oh, man, that's really great. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell Peter about you. Uh, you know, just, you know this, I, I think we ought to bring somebody like you. We need more support people. I followed up once a month with Hannah for 18 months. And then they started booking me. And I got to share the stage in huge arenas, three, 5,000 people uh, with, with Zig Ziglar and Rudy Giuliani and all these greats, and you know, because I did that. That's that's amazing. So yeah. this, this is just like, just like in, you know, in networking and trying to, to build relationships, we reach out to so many people and, you know, we get stories in our private group about people saying, I'm trying, I'm trying, no one's responding. And it's just so nice to see another example of success where you, you know, you keep trying and eventually you're going to get some breaks and you can make, you know, one interaction, build one relationship can open up so many doors. So this oh, is really, really enough. Enough. That's right. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't watch too much TV. I'm too busy, you know, trying to get to the Olympics, right? But, uh, but uh, anyways, uh, uh, there's a screenplay get, getting, that's been written up. Right, and, and, and it's you know we're trying to it, it's moving forward, right? right? And it'll probably be you know hopefully you'll see me in the movies one of these years, and hopefully it's a good movie, right? <laughs> hopefully I mess it up. But somebody said, you know who we, we ought to get to play you that Mark guy, Mark uh, the guy that played the plays the Hulk, right? And in, in, in these movies, right? And he showed me a picture. He just even looks like you. I, said, I never even heard of this guy, right? But I went online. Mark Ruffalo. 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 That's right. That's right. And so I went to, to uh, YouTube and there was an interview of him. He had six, over 600 auditions before he got his first part. 
Amazing. Working and quit on 599. Amazing. And that's a great note uh, to end on here, Ruben. Thank you for going above and beyond with us and really just delivering tons of value. Uh, thank you, Mary, too, for that question. Uh, I'm excited for you. I know you got a, a talking, a speaking event today, too. So congratulations. And oh, thanks. Uh, thank you for everything. Please go to uh, Ruben's website. It's The Luge Man, right? The Luge Man. Yeah, the you Luge can also Man. go to oldestolympian.com. That's a. <laughs> I'm going to be the oldest one ever in the Winter Olympics. I'll be 59, man. If you see a guy from Argentina at the opening ceremonies with a walker, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Check out his book, too, The Courage to Succeed. Please thank Ruben in the chat box. Thank you so much, Ruben. Take care. We'll see you Bye, with or without the walker very, very soon. No, without I know, the walker. I know you'll be there. I know you'll be there. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to bring our next guest on here. Uh, thank you for, for uh, waiting I don't know how I'm gonna follow that. <laughs> I, know, I was thinking, I was like, how do I even like comment? I just wanted to let him go. It was amazing, just amazing. You can see why he's one of the world's top speakers. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to have Asia on with us again. Uh, Asia completed her MS in pathology at the University of Iowa, and then uh, obtained her MBA from the Darden Graduate School of Business, a top 10 uh, MBA program in the US and worldwide. She has over 10 years of experience working in industry Amgen, largest biotech in the world, Baxter at Salta Shire, now Takeda, where she is the director of new product planning. We're showing LinkedIn profiles today. So this is Asia, as you can see that she has used a picture too of in the background, uh, light going through trees. I'm not sure the symbolism there, but it helps to have that over the, uh, the, uh, the standard background. So Asia, thanks for being on with us. I appreciate it. I know that you don't have a ton of time. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions here related to what Ruben talked about. You know, I want to dig in first to kind of the anxiety, the periods that you can think back to when you were moving from position to position in industry, when the business was changing. So we talked about two things today in the Show Me the Data section, dispositional stress, so like the internal anxiety of stressful moments, and then the situational stress, like the external stuff happening, the merger acquisition, etc. So. What did, what did those times feel like for you, you know, during the challenging moments? And then what sort of internal and external resources do you call upon uh, to get through them? Yeah, so first of all, I'll just say, you guys can't control everything as much as you might want to, right? You can only kind of control your own emotions and I guess the dispositional um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that I have, through the course of my career handled handling that is realizing that actually the situational stress does impact my individual stress quite a bit. But if I have a good sense of kind of forecasting what those situations might be, that makes me feel less anxious about them. So again, can't control sort of what's happening outside, but if I can foresee or anticipate what's happening outside, then I start to create a plan and anticipate what those changes are, and I'm lining up my options all along the way. So to maybe bring that to kind of a real level would be uh, my experience working at Baxalta when we were acquired by Shire. That was an extremely stressful point in my life. Now, I'll say that, you know, there were personal things involved in that, right? Like I have a six-year-old son, I'm completely responsible for him. Right, And so when I think that there's going to be a big shift and change from a merger and acquisition, that has very real implications on my life, right? So there's a drive to understand what that change might be. So I had anticipated something like that coming because frankly, M&A happens all the time, but also just the position where we were as a company. And if you think that I waited until the deal was announced to start lining up my options, no, absolutely not. I could foresee it coming for a long time. I was already working with some of my mentors um, and talking with friends and colleagues about what my options would be so that when that did come through and did come to pass, there was I didn't miss a beat on knowing what I could do next. Now, that comes with a little bit of maturity and learning and knowledge and understanding what can happen in the marketplace and understanding how that impacts you individually. So it does take some time and some knowledge to kind of get to that point. It also takes, um, I guess, <laughs> quite a bit of confidence to know that 
even when something like that comes, you're going to be okay if you've been doing the work up front, right? So the fact that you guys are here in GE Scientist is fantastic. That's a really big step in understanding um, how to get into industry. But once you're in industry, you got to continue to learn so that you can morph and kind of be flexible through all those changes. Yeah, and I think this ties in really well to what Ruben was saying. So a couple of things. Number one, you know, the anxiety hits. There's a change. Maybe you couldn't anticipate it. It's there. So I'll, let's dig in real quick to how do you, you – basically what you're talking about is getting out in front of it, right? Yep. And I think part of that is focusing on your locus of control. So can yep. you walk through that a little bit? Like how long – and like you said, the confidence really just shortens that turnaround time. Like you go from, you're, you know, being floored, uncertainty, wheel spinning – and then the more you know, the more you've gone through this before, like Ruben said, the more practice, the more your brain's used to it. When he was yeah. doing the parasailing and everything else, you get better and better and better at it. And then you can right. get out in front faster. So, but can you talk a little bit more practically about what that looks like? Is there a key question you tell yourself? Is there how do you decide what your locus of control is? Yeah. Well, the, the really one of the only kind of low side of control, if that's the word, you've heard, is your relationships right, and how you interact with other people and ensuring that you have your tribe kind of around you to help you out when there is a period of extreme stress or a massive change. So I can control how I interact with people, my relationships, my mentor relationships in particular, right, and making sure that I'm maintaining that over time. Um, so, you know, in massive kind of stressor point, I turn to my people, I turn to my circle, and I ask questions, and I start to kind of look outside of myself. The, the points when I start to feel most stressed are the times where I start looking outward most, because I know myself, and I know that if I allow myself to succumb to that stress, I can get very internally focused, and that's not helpful. That actually leads to more stress. You gotta look out for that help, and you've got to turn to some other people to get pers to gain perspective, right? Because you kind of lose perspective in in, in real moments of stress. Yeah. And, and so what Age is talking about again is what we went through with the show me the day section. Think of that third figure. It's difficult to unpack, but there was the dispositional stress, right? The, the stress of the internal part, which he's talking about. But there's the, the external stress too, and the external stress can increase the internal stress and vice versa. What were the three things that helped people get over that ability? motivation right and emotional intelligence or just intelligence so turning to your ability knowing that you've been through this before you can get through it what are your key strengths you know you talked about relationship that's a key strength so knowing that you have those things to turn to you've turned to them in the past focusing on your ability taking action motivation you know asia mentioned the fact she has a kid so she's motivated you have to tap into your why why does this matter why are you going to get through this why are you going to be unstoppable in this moment Ruben touched on that a lot too, but also your your intelligence, whether it's emotional or just your pure intelligence, you have to know if you're watching this, you're an intelligent person. You're a P, you know you, you have a you have a PhD, you have a background in STEM. These are highly difficult concepts. You've reached the highest level in X Y Z field. Know that, know that you can figure out a solution here. If anybody else has before, you can do it. And so I think if you can rely on those three things, it can help you. So in terms of your ability, Asia, the last thing I wanted to, to ask you is. What are some of the things that you look to in the past that give you confidence that you can handle things like this in the future? Right? How does that process work for you? I could write a whole book about that, um, and maybe I should someday. Um, a part of it comes from just experience and being in really stressful moments, frankly, my entire life, um, and realizing that uh, the current thing that I'm facing isn't all that bad, right? It's stressful, but it isn't all that bad. I'm going to survive it. And and not only that, but if I can shift my framework a little bit, I might thrive in that opportunity, right? If I behave in a certain way, I might thrive. I might be seen as somebody who can thrive in that environment and be given different opportunities. So I, I and maybe this is just my personal makeup a little bit, like I, I don't really shy away from the stress, right? I don't shy away from the change. I take it head on. Um, but I'm able to do that because I've been through some of these things before and I know that I'm okay. And in fact, most of the time I've been a lot better off for, right. for having gone through that experience. So if you can kind of get to that point, um, 
or at least recognize that the stress and the pain that you're feeling is actually like shaping you and in, 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 in a way that you can be better later on having that perspective and holding on to that through it um, does actually help um i don't know but yeah. that's more no that's perfect than what you're looking for. no it was actually look, let me make it practical so when you reach out to somebody it might feel like you're going to die you're not going to die okay you can follow <laughs> up and you're going to be fine so actually i mean I'm many i've been on calls and things with you guys a lot of times you may have actually seen i have this like bracelet um, and it and it literally says 20 seconds on it I got a bracelet that says 20 seconds on it because of some silly movie quote that actually resonated with me which is you only need 20 seconds of insane courage or bravery just do it just take 20 seconds to do the thing that you're worried about and you will be pleased with the consequences right and I've used that many times in my life whether it's in business or personal Use it for me, it means opening myself up to the opportunity, going for it, and what's the worst thing that can happen? Somebody says no, who cares? Like go to someone else, or maybe you need to ask it a different way. So sometimes I just, I, I literally have a physical reminder on my wrist I wear every single day to have just a tiny bit of courage and just do something about it. Just take the action and, and you'll start to gain momentum. Yeah, and a lot of people struggle with that. You know, it's that transition point, and Ruben touched on it, but just that beginning, making that initial call, dialing the number, once it rings, they pick up, and now you're in the conversation. Done, took 20 seconds. I'm sorry. And what's the worst? Like, you might be a little embarrassed. Like, nobody remembers that stuff. Like, you, you know, I always think of some things, like sometimes when I'm in a city and I'm doing something silly or something new, I'm like, no one here knows me, <laughs> right? They aren't gonna remember that I was skipping down the street in Barcelona, who cares, right? Like. You can take that kind of approach to your business um, and, and to your job search. Like, people aren't going to remember really the missteps, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if they do, who cares? It, it doesn't have an impact to you. And uh, the very last thing I, I just want to touch on, I want to show this. Um, Asia is the, the program leader for Scientist MBA. I did mention at the beginning that the enrollment is open for this advanced program. So a lot of the stuff that you're talking about in business, like gaining that confidence, We've been talking about all week how a lot of it comes down to understanding the language of business, the nomenclature, and understanding how to make decisions. So you, the, the more you increase your understanding of the business nomenclature, the more you increase your business acumen, your ability to make decisions, the better you can handle these stressful situations, right? The more you, the, the faster you can get out in front of it, like it said, like you said. So what are some of the things that you've just seen, you know, recently in some of the, the members of Scientist MBA in terms of something that would freak them out before, they couldn't even handle, like on an interview or a promotion comes up, that now they're handling differently. Like what is the change that you see that this knowledge, right, and speaking it every day with other people who are also speaking these business concepts help them? So like you said, how does knowledge translate into confidence, translate into better performance? Yeah, so that knowledge is gonna help you forecast and predict, like I said. It helps you build that plan. It also gives you the courage to actually speak up and ask a question that might not seem like a normal PhD question, right, to ask. So I think it's it's the classic like knowledge is power. Once you have some of that knowledge, you're able to, to kind of put yourself into a different position. You're able to put yourself out there. You're able to think, think differently and ahead and predict the future and then of course plan your course of action. Well, thank you very much for your time. Please thank Asia for her time as well. Again, Scientist MBA is open for two more days. Asia is a program leader. There's a board of that MBAs. Uh, we'll put the link in the chat box so you can learn more about it. Asia, thank you for your time. Of course. All right, so we're gonna move forward. We have another guest on with us. Very excited to bring on uh, our guest here. Let me make sure I have her bio up before bringing her on. Uh, her name is Arena. Mencia Castano, and I think I got that right. Arena, how did how did I do? Did I do pretty good? Make sure we get your audio on here. Can you hear me okay? Arena, no? I'll try to get you on here. I'm gonna do the uh, the intro for you, and then uh, Mary, make sure that we can we can hear you. So, uh, Arena, Arena, I think I got it right there. Right? Arena Mencia Castano did her PhD in bioengineering and biomedical 
Engineering at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. After her postdoc, Irene worked as a consultant in life sciences, R&D, and financial planning. Um, in 2018, June 2018, she accepted a position as a senior innovative consultant in Inspiralia, probably need help on that too, Madrid, say that one. Uh, in her spare time, uh, Arena is a dancer. She has used her skills as a performer to fuel her networking. Now we talk a lot about blue ocean networking, not just going to the same PhD networking events, but learning to meet people elsewhere who have shared connections that are working in the companies you want to work for. Powerful te technique that a lot of PhDs don't apply. Um, she won an elevator pitch competition, which opened the door to new professional opportunities. LinkedIn profile is here again somebody else using that headline banner and notice that you can have text in it like we talked about we'll come back to that later let's try now Arena can you hear me okay maybe she might be frozen let me bring on Mary here maybe Mary you can help you can help us or you can we can vamp and go through your LinkedIn profile I'm not sure if, if we lost her eye for us if you can hear me okay can you type in yes in the chat box please yes great all right, Mary, where's Mary at? There we go. Can Hello. You, did she freeze? Yeah. I think she did freeze, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see, uh, see let's, if she can come back. Let's see if we can get her on. So I'm gonna remove, was I saying her name right at least? Irene. Irene. Lencia Castano. Irene, maybe we should just, we should just insert your <laughs> audio. I think I'm trying to say. Irene. All right, so I'm trying to remove Let's try, let me try making a call with somebody that will allow her to come back on. So, Irene, if you can hear us, uh, we need you to come back on, probably sign off, come back on, and then we'll stop the video. All right, so we're going to move forward. Do we, uh, can we, who's going to come on? I think we have a question. We can bring a question yep. on during this time, right? Sure, I think so. We have a question from Mario. So, I'm going to promote him to panelist. And I should say, uh, this is still the public right now. Um, the public Dr. show. Mar yes. Mario can ask his question. Hi, Mario. Can you hear us okay? I'm going to see if we can start your video. And we will bring you on to ask the question you have about transitioning into industry. So I think we can hear you. We just need to click the button to start your video. I'll make you a co-host in case that's required now. Uh, we're using the Zoom platform that has Maybe we can just read Mario's question. All right, let's let me let me dig it up one second here. So so he he is still trying to figure out what kind of position to focus on, um, and he wants to he, he's he's invested a lot in his theoretical and technical training, and he wants to apply that somewhere, and he's just trying to see where he fits in. Got it. So that's a great question. So we'll see if Mario comes on, and we can talk with him more about it. So how many of you who are watching or listening have experienced this before? Tell me in the chat box, right? Like, you know you want to transition into industry, you know there's not a future for you in academia, but you don't really know where to start, you don't know what position, positions are right for you, right? Something a lot of you have, so Antonio says yes, me, Riley says yes, I'm still struggling with this. Um, Deepak says me, Manishree says me. So Mario, Mario did have, did mention in the chat box that he can't come on by video. Maybe come, maybe uh, leave and come back on. That might help. We'll see if we can get you back on. But your question is appreciated. So, one of the biggest mistakes that PhDs make is we try to jump right to finding job titles that we like. We don't really know about the position. We just focus on a job title. Oh, I really like the sound of medical science liaison. Oh, I really like the sound of data scientist. This is trending right now. I see a lot of it. And so we just think that, oh, it must be important. That must be the right job for me. Management consultant's another one. But then you start digging into what the professional lifestyle is and you realize, oh, to be a management consultant, sometimes I have to, first of all, fly to other countries for like three months at a time, right, to work with that company very intensely, staring at spreadsheets for 18 hours a day, getting no relief whatsoever for these blocks of time that can be three months. It's very intense. Some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, if you have kids, you know it might be hard to go to a different country. MSL, you're traveling 70, 80% of the time, right? These lifestyle factors matter it's your professional lifestyle so really instead of going after the job titles first you want to figure out the professional lifestyle 
that you want, okay? Figure out the professional lifestyle that you want first and then fit a job title to that. And there are some key questions you can ask. So I know we have, we have a, a link to a, a little uh, walkthrough that can help you identify some of the career paths that are good for you. Now, if you're one of our associates, um, you have access to this. You also have access to our top 40 position guide for PhDs. Mario, I think we can hear you by audio. If you want to jump on by audio, that's fine too if you can't get on by video. Can you hear me? I heard a door slam. I just assumed that was you. So if you, if you don't know where to start, one thing that you want to do, and we'll put in the ManyChat link if we can find it. I know we have it somewhere. We can put it in the post show notes to this map. Now, if you are an associate, you get access to this all the time, right? And this can help you kind of see what positions might be right for you. And we've really dug in here to identify, right, if you look at the key in the top left, some of the key positions, some of the key factors that a lot of PhDs look at. It might be a little bit small on your screen. Let's see if I can zoom in on it. Oh, I can't get it. Right, so look at this. So the top left, a green dot in the position means salary in the top 10%. Purple dot means travel greater than 50% required. Red dot means it's a filled position. Blue dot means in-house position. Orange dot means innovative position. Pink dot means commercial position, right? More on the commercialization side. Gray dot means numbers heavy, like this would be more of data scientist, business analyst. And then this navy dot means, you got color blind right there, that's navy, not black. Uh, writing intensive position. Now, the question to start is, what PhD level industry job is right for you? The five key categories you want to look at is, okay, do you enjoy information aggregation and patents, sales and marketing, research and development, clinical and medical affairs, or business finance and policy, right? So just chunk it down. Figure out that question first. Which of those five areas fits with the professional lifestyle you want the most, is most closely aligned to your strengths? We break it down even further into a sentence that'll help clarify, right? So you're like, information aggregation and patents, what does that mean? Read the little quote below it. I want to learn about, write about, edit, analyze, and patent the latest innovations and information related to these information, uh, related to these uh, innovations. If we jump down to clinical and medical affairs, it says I want to liaise with medical staff and be involved in the regulation and development of medical drugs, treatments, and implants. Okay. Now some of these, business finance and policy is one, break down into a few more uh, larger subcategories. Financial services, business and strategy, research policy, and funding uh, research policy, funding, and government. At the top, it's intellectual property, writing and editing, information and data management. Those are the three subcategories of information aggregation and patents. Now, for the rest of these, you can see what the actual job titles are, right? So if you go down the research and development path, it breaks down into industrial postdoc, don't need to learn this, but we'll get it on there because it is a position in the industry. R&D scientist, Technology Assessment and Alliance Manager, R&D Project Manager, Quality Assurance and Quality Control Manager, Health Economics and Outcome Research. You probably didn't even know at least two or three of those existed, okay? All right, so what else? Let's look at Clinical and Medical Affairs. You follow the line, Epidemiologist, Clinical Trials Project Manager, Regulatory Affairs, Medical Affairs, those two, Regulatory Affairs, Medical Affairs, very, very popular right now. Medical Science Liaison, lots of PhDs getting into this position. Clinical Research Associate, Clinical uh, Data Manager, which breaks down further into Clinical Research Coordinator, Clinical Research Organization. Now, if you are an associate, see these little numbers? If, if you're watching this publicly, you can download this. We'll put in a mini chat link into the post show notes. Um, you can check out the blog with all of the post show notes that comes out on Friday. Or if you return to wherever you're watching this, we'll have the post show notes in about an hour. Um, the numbers in the bottom right, though, for those of you who are associates, this will connect. Let's see if I can go back here. This connects to the industry positions guide that we've seen here. Those numbers correlate to the actual position titles, and you can go through and read a few pages on what that position entails, the transferable skills you need, how to apply to it. All right, so this takes us to the end of the public portion of our show. Thank you for watching. Make sure you go check out Ruben Gonzalez's uh, page, The Luge Man. Check out his book, The Courage to Succeed. Make sure you go check out Scientist MBA. You can just Google search the Scientist MBA. If you have a STEM background and you're lacking business knowledge like a lot of us uh, were or are as PhDs, make sure you check that out. If you have any questions on this, please let them know in the comment box below. Remember, we go live every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, just about every Wednesday. Every Wednesday.
Mountain Bay, Eastern Standard Time. Go to that main chat link that was at the beginning of this video, which you can jump back to now. Click that send message button. We will alert you with a short message just saying, hey, we're live. We don't wanna miss live because we do have a gift that we give out, we give out gifts. We have certain uh, things that you'll get just for showing up. Uh, so make sure you tune in next week because we are going to showcase a free show up bonus for you. It is our current industry trends, what we as brand new. So stay tuned for that next week. Next week, we have a great show lined up, more details to come. If you're watching us on Facebook, we'll see you all next week for, the, for another Sheepy Scientist radio show. All right, if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you for watching. We will see you next week, 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another Cheeky Scientist radio show.